is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 598. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources, and joining me online, all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, welcome back. We missed you. Yo, yo. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was nice taking a week off of the old uh, the, the the yoke of the podcast, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you you you're back in the field now, ready to start yep. plowing. That, that makes you that makes you the farmer getting pulled by the ox, I guess. Yeah, but, you're uh, the ox. I'm the farmer. I'll take it. <laughs> um, it was great though. We we had Tom Ross on last week. Had a great conversation with him. Uh, but now you're back, baby, and uh, we're going to be doing the Q and A episode uh, this week, where we've got a ton of questions from listeners. So we'll try to get into those as uh, as quickly. As we can. Before we do, kind of mention our sponsor, channelfireball.com. It's a place to go for really anything you need magic related. They're going to have it. Um, you know, you can get supplies over there. You can get, um, apparel, even at least some of it. Uh, you can get single sealed product. You can do box breaks. You can get CFB Pro. There's always a lot of stuff going on over at Channel Fireball. And we highly recommend you, you, you check them out for really anything you need. You know, they, they ship quickly. They've always been known for their quick shipments and, um, They'll get those cards out to you just as soon as possible from their warehouse and get them into your hands so that you can battle. I know that, you know, as we start to look forward uh, for the pandemic stuff starting to, you know, gradually release and maybe local game stores or gatherings will start to be uh, more of a thing. Well, you're probably going to need some some stuff to spruce up your commander deck or re-sleeve or get some new deck boxes or whatever. And you can find all of it over at Channel Fireball. If you do end up picking up anything, if you'd use the affiliate code LR, I'd appreciate it. It helps out the show and lets them know that we sent you over. The show is also brought to you by you via the Patreon. Um, you know, this is the way that you can give back to the creators and that type of thing that, that you enjoy every day. It's a really cool model. Um, didn't used to exist in the world. And it meant that there was a lot of uh, content that just never got to get made at all. And now thanks to sites like Patreon, we can do shows like this and we have our audience. They support us and we can uh, keep doing the show going forward where we don't have to answer to a bigger entity that says, well, you know, we, we've decided to go in a different direction. We've canceled your show and it's just over. Instead, we go directly to the people who, who listen to the show, who love the show and support it. And uh, Patreon's the vehicle that you can support the show uh, if you'd like to. Um, all the information's over at patreon.com slash limited resources. Uh, let's do a cracker pack real quick, Luis. Uh, we'll just kind of cruise through a uh, strict saving cracker pack here and, uh, then we'll get to the, to the questions. Uh, oh, and I should also mention after the cracker pack, we've got our uh, preview cards. We've got a bunch of them to go through, uh, for modern horizons too. So we'll, we'll cruise through those as well, but strict saving, um, First card out is Academic Probation. It's actually a rare source, uh, a rare lesson. It's the one in a white you sorcery. You choose one. You choose a non-land card name, and opponents can't cast spells with the chosen name until your next turn. Or you choose target non-land permanent, and until your next turn, it can't attack block, and its activated abilities can't be activated. I never end up taking Academic Probation high, though I have actually had it in a couple of decks. And, you know... As narrow and situational as it is, there are that's kind of what you want out of a lesson anyway. And there are times when you just need a temporary removal spell to push through the last damage, and, and this can do that. It's just I never pick it highly enough to actually have it in my deck. Yeah, it, it's a great card if you can cast it, but because in the situations where it's good, it's going to be exactly what you want. But it's also a card I just I don't know. Are people third picking these or something? Because I just don't really end up with them that often. I know it's yeah. a rare, so you're not going to see it that often to begin with. But definitely, uh, definitely a strong lesson to have access to, but not something you probably want to take first or second pick. By the way, uh, two rares and counting. Uh, basic conjuration. We got a foil one. It's one green green for another lesson. Look at the top six cards your library. Um, you may reveal a creature card from among them. Put it in your hand. Put the rest on the bottom, and you gain three life. Totally fine, right? Basic conjuration's a a fine magic card, especially to have in your in your lesson pile. It's especially good in a deck that has some like particularly high quality creatures, mm -hmm. and it's a significant upgrade from something like Introduction to Prophecy. Getting to look deeper for a creature only, so it's a little bit less consistent, but also gaining three is is, is huge. So. I like basic conjuration a lot. I would I wouldn't mind being pretty aggressively or taking it pretty aggressively here. Yeah. Next is crushing disappointment, which is 
probably a fairly apt name for it. Although perhaps even better name for the next card, which is Ogyar Battleseer, which has also been a <laughs> crushing disappointment. Uh, Pillar Drop Warden's next. This guy's been nice. The three and a red, one five with reach. You can pay two tap sack it to return an instant or sorcery. I play these pretty frequently. This is a card I want in my, in my team or decks, which is pretty much all I draft now. Yeah, no, Pillar Drop Warden's great. It's yeah. a good blocker until you need to rebuy something good. And again, like cards of this type, when you have something like Attempted by the Auric or you know, any powerful spell, it becomes even more of a threat to your opponent. And it's not that easy to kill either. No, it's not. It's actually a pretty good blocker too. Uh, Relic Sloth, 4-4 four, four Menace, Vigilance, Underperformer in the format. Twin Scroll Shaman, same. Even with a bunch of combat tricks around, Twin Scroll, Scroll Shaman just yeah. never quite comes, to, comes together. It's really funny because in my very first match – I played against a Twin Scroll Shaman, and I had an absolutely absurd sequence happen. I, I actually screenshotted it. I'll dig it up and, and tweet it or something at some point. But my opponent played uh, – I was at 20, <laughs> and they attacked, and I didn't block. And they played the plus two, plus oh, first strike, make a treasure. And then they played Infuriate, and then they played the one and a white, copy it for each, like storm, plus one, plus one counter thing, and they killed me. <laughs> and I was like, is that what this format's going to be like? <laughs> like, holy crap, because <laughs> they just added three, four, five, six, seven, eight power to it or whatever. And they had one other thing. And I'm like, OK, I guess I'm just dead. Um, Spectre of the Fens is next right on that borderline. Definitely playable, but definitely not amazing. Um, I'm still actually on basic conjuration at this point uh, for my pick. Same. Yeah. Uh, Arcane Subtraction. That's the one in a blue instant gives minus four, minus zero to a creature until the turn and you learn. I play these. They're fine. Um, not not the pick here. Spectacle Mage. I like this card. One blue, red, two, two flyer. And it makes uh, your sorceries and in, uh, instants that have a mana value of five or more cost one less to cast. I'm a little I, – I notched it half a notch down from where I had it before, but I still freely <laughs> play it. I think it's still fine. I, I can't see this card without thinking about the fact that you drafted five of them in the like <laughs> showdown. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit much. Um, Mage Hunter. This is a three and a black three four horror. And uh, whenever it has like reverse mage craft, you it drains. Uh, it, you're, you lose a your opponents lose life when they cast an instant or sorcery. Meh. I liked it more when I first saw it than I do now. Again, you can put it in your deck. It's not a horrible card, but it's certainly not great. Ten the pest. This one's kind of interesting. This is the green black. Instant is additional cost to cast that you sack a creature and you get uh, X11 pests where uh, equal to that creature's power. I like 10 the pests once I already have like a Demogoth Woe Eater or a Demogoth Titan, mm -hmm. but I'm not looking to, to first pick that here. I think I'm still on basic conjuration over Mage Hunter. Those are like the first two for me, but yeah, yeah I'm not. Yeah, I'm looking at basic conjuration and spectacle mage and I'm still on basic. Uh, solve the equation. Uh, this one is going to yep. remain unsolved for me. And then we do have uh, – well, I should mention – so we've got Opt as our Mystical Archive. So that's uh, a card I actually play basically every time I get my hands on it, but it's not a priority. So let's see if this rare can save us from our other two rares. And it's Exponential Growth. That's the XX Green Green Sorcery until the turn double target creature's power X times. I When we did the set review, I gave this a, a pretty low grade – and I kind of put it in the in my patented category of you're going to have to kill me with this a few times before I start playing it. And I have yet to actually <laughs> die to this card, so I'm still just off it. Well, I've died to this card, and I've won games with this card, and I still think it's bad, so I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't hold my breath. Like, it's got its moments for sure. And yeah, decks that have some good evasive creatures or tramplers, like it's good on like Water Wheel Aerialist or something like that. Mm, you can mm -hmm. put the card in your deck, but, you know, Vortex Runner shines with it. But – yeah, I, I, I would just take basic conjuration here, start building out your lesson board. Not, not an exciting pack, but you know what? They can't all be. Yeah, and that's what I would do too. And that is a powerful card to have in your lessons. Okay. Um, I will say they can all be exciting if you draft the current Magic Online Vintage Cube. Ah, that for a segue. very nice. <laughs> yes, yes, this that's the, great. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, you know, Magic, the, the folks at Magic Online talked to, to me and Gabby a couple months ago. And so Gabby has a Vintage Cube that we draft here in Denver. We hadn't updated it for a while but they were interested in running it on Magic Online. So we uh, updated it. We added a bunch of new cards. We took out the silver border cards, which unfortunately can't, you know, can't really translate online. And it's now on Magic Online. Uh, it's going to be up until this coming Wednesday. So that's 
I don't know, the, 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 the second or something like that. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've, I've gotten to do three or four drafts already, and I look forward to doing many more. It's uh, basically the Vintage Cube, but we trimmed the cards that we thought weren't, like, very good or fun. And, you know, that, that opened up spots for some cool new stuff. So I, I think that if uh, you enjoy Vintage Cube, definitely give it a spin. It's got a lot of the same notes that you'll expect from a Vintage Cube, but different card choices. And I think it's pretty well tuned as well. So I would definitely check that out on Magic Online. Yeah, I saw that you drafted like a Life from the Loam deck today. And I was like, oh, yeah, Life from the Loam. Like that isn't in anybody's cube anymore. Yeah, we, we have more of a lands package with Life from the Loam, Hex, Vampire Hex Mage, Thespian Stage, Dark Depths, Crop Rotation. Sweet. Uh, all, all, all that kind of stuff. So I think that uh, the cube ends up – it adds a little uh, – slightly new angle to it. And, you know, it already had some support with like Oracle Moldiah, Red and Six, Crucible of Worlds, Strip Mine, that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm going to uh, draft that cube on my stream next next Tuesday. So that will be sweet. Um, so before we get into our questions, Luis, we do have our uh, – Preview cards. So the first batch that we have here is a group of five um, basic land cyclers, a cycle of basic land cycle cyclers. So one for each color, and they all have basic line, land cycling one and then one of whatever their color is. So like the blue one is basic land cycling one and a blue, which means you can pay one and a blue and discard this card to search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, and put it in your hand and then shuffle which is great, really great mechanic for limited. It smooths out your your draws. It makes sure you can hit your land drops and it also even fixes you a bit. And then the question becomes, because when I see these cards, my mentality is like, I'm putting these in because they're going to be basic land cyclers a lot of the time. And then I'll cast them a good percentage of the time too. It's, it's not, you know, it's certainly not a small amount, but you know, I'm pretty happy with kind of whatever they do. If I get the basic land cycling and these actually are pretty powerful. One of them is world weary. It's three black, black enchant creature creature gets minus four, minus four. So five mana, basically a removal spell for most creatures. So that's pretty good. Red is battle plan. It's three and a red enchantment at the beginning of combat on your turn. Target creature you control gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. Which is, you know, if you have a bunch of tokens or evasive stuff or just a lot of creatures, battle plan can be, you don't want a ton of these type of cards, but yeah, they can actually matter and, and, and get your opponent dead. The blue one's dope. It's mental journey. It's four blue, blue, instant draw three cards. Yeah, I'm into that. And then there's Orchard Strider, which is four GG, six, four tree folk. And when it ETBs, you get two food tokens and then the white one kind of seems like it got shafted here. It's Landscaper yeah. Colos. It's a goat beast. It's five and a white for a four, six. And when it ETBs, put target card from an opponent's graveyard on the bottom of their library. Take that opponent. Yeah, I don't, that, that one's so much worse than the rest of them. It's a pretty dramatic drop in power. Weird. It's weird. Yeah. But these are sweet cards, right? Yeah, no, no, these are all all quite good. Like they're also basic land cycling. They're not just like plain cycling. So mm -hmm. they 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 can help like a three, four, five color deck. And then casting any of these except the white one is going to be pretty rewarding. The red one is a little bit more out of place in that it's an aggressive card, and the aggressive decks are probably not going to want to spend turn two land cycling. But mm -hmm. all the rest of them fit pretty nicely into basically any deck of those colors. Yeah, so that's sweet. Um, so th that's something to look forward to. And then we got another one, uh, which is actually a rare. It's called Gaia's Will. You want to read that one? So Gaia's Will is a uh, sorcery. It has no casting cost. This is kind of like Ancestral Vision. It's got the same deal where you can't cast it, but you can suspend it. It has suspend four for a single green mana. And it's a sorcery that is Yawgmoth's Will. Until end of turn, you may play lands and cast spells from your graveyard. If a card would be put into your graveyard from anywhere this turn, exile that card instead. And in this context, spells means anything. Like you can cast, you know, creatures, you can cast artifacts, planeswalkers, or whatever you want. Uh, instant sorceries. So it's Yogmas will, but you have to wait <clears throat> four turns to make it pop, unless you cheat by like cascading into it or using as foretold or or any of those things. Mm -hmm. Certainly an exciting card. I don't know what exactly this is going to do, but definitely has some some good stuff going and it seems pretty interesting and limited too. You just suspend this thing on like turn three and you're like, all right, on turn seven I'm gonna get to cast two or three spells. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, it's pretty cool. So those are our cards for Modern Horizons 2. We'll probably be doing a set primer 
I think not next week, but the week after might be good for that. Um, cause we'll have all the cards by then. And, and that's right before the pre-release for it. So I think we'll aim for that. Um, okay. So let's get into the questions, Luis, uh, from, from our listeners, uh, from the Patreon. Um, the first one comes from Fromaginator who says, how do you two divide? Let's see. He says, how do you two divide the payment for the show? Is it by height, PT top eights, or some third method? I don't need to know amounts. I'm just curious about the ratio. <laughs> you, you want to tackle that one? <laughs> no, we're not going to tell you that. That's that's between Luis and I. Um, and it yeah, is by height. It's, it, it is between Hi, Marshall Lions Chair Sutcliffe and <laughs> <laughs> Luis Table Scraps Vargas. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh my God. Thanks a lot for Imaginator. I'm going to get hell for this for weeks. <laughs> Table scraps. Wow. Uh, yeah. I just sent you a check too, I guess. <laughs> didn't feel like table scraps when I wrote it. Um, Brian says, Marshall, have you ever considered completing the trifecta of doing a podcast with BK? I'd love to hear you two talk about basketball. Seriously. Also, what are you, who are you rooting for in the playoffs? Hopefully by the time you read this, the Blazers will be up two one over the nuggets and hopefully Seattle will have a team again soon. Thanks, guys. Love the show. Um, no, of course, I've never considered doing a podcast with BK. He's just not on the level yet. He's got some learning to do before he's ready to step into the arena with the big guys. Uh, as far as basketball goes, I'm rooting for the Nets. Uh, I've been a, a displaced Seattle Supersonics fan since they were ruthlessly stolen from our city in 2008. I took mm, about four years off of rooting for an NBA team because I was so upset that the Sonics were gone, but then I missed um, talking about and watching and rooting for basketball. So in 2012, 2013, the Nets moved from New Jersey to Brooklyn. They got new jerseys and new a new look and some cool stuff. And I decided, all right, that's going to be my team. Uh, they immediately mortgaged their entire future for <laughs> five or six years after an attempted run at the uh, at, at, in a deep run in the playoffs. And so I've been watching a very crappy Nets team for a lot of years in a row now. And now it's all kind of come full circle. When the Sonics left, they had Kevin Durant. They, we had him for one year. We had drafted him, and now he plays for the Nets. So I get to root for him again. And they are currently the favorites to win the NBA championship. But, of course, uh, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, Jurgen says, from my perspective, the last years of Limited have been really awesome. Thus, I feel... Um, it has been a positive trend. Um, in your estimate, where will Limited uh, in Magic be in two to three years if they continue on the path they are now? What steps do you think they should take to trend even more positively in the coming years? Hmm. Well, I, I agree that Limited has been awesome recently. Like every set is is quite strong. I mean, if you look at like Zendikar Rising, Ikoria, Kaldheim, Strixhaven, like Kaldheim and Strixhaven in, in particular, I I drafted a ton of and I, I really enjoyed those two a little more than the others, but all of them are just high quality limited sets. Like I really don't have any complaints about them. Where does that take us? I don't know that it takes us any particular place. Like if every limited set just keeps being good, that's great. Like, you know, we're, we're going to be happy we're playing limited. I don't, I don't know that there's like a bigger picture thing outside of that though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question I have uh, is – They've obviously nailed the formula, right? Like the the way that they make the sets has become more and more refined. They've made some adjustments to the design philosophy. And they clearly have now what – if they check these boxes, they come out with a solid, good, limited set. The question becomes, are they willing to break from that occasionally to keep – to mix it up? Or do they even need to? Right. Like, if, is this formula kind of like something that they could do indefinitely and we would just be happy? Or at some point, do we go, OK, I kind of see the pattern here and I want something a little bit different. And that's my guess is that it's the first one that they could just sort of keep doing it because these things are so complicated. It's not like, you know, it's not like we just break these things down on day one and just go, yeah, I'm kind of bored of this now. It's like there's a lot to learn about these, even if they are, you know, somewhat similar from set to set. Well, one thing I do think. If there were going to be a change, though, I, I do agree with you that like it's not unreasonable for them to just continue to continue, you know, structuring their sets the way they are now. Uh, they are pretty high on like 
you never running out of cards, like mm -hmm. there being, you know, the modal double faced cards or uh, lessons or flashback or whatever it ends up being that, you know, like like a lot of the top commons and called him like Drew cards, for example, mm -hmm. you know, like all, you, you, in, in, in limited sets these days, you just kind of don't run out of gas. And that has been a feature, right? It is fun to get to play, always have cards to play. I could see them pulling back on that and maybe doing a slightly like a resource light set if uh, if it turns out that people want a slightly different experience. Because I, I don't think you always want to have the experience of like, yep, you're, you you always have action. Just the, no games that go down to top decks or very few games, I should say, go down to top decks. And that's one one area where I think they could probably switch things up a bit. But for the most part, if they just keep making sets on par with this, like I'm just not going to complain. It's going to be great. Yeah, that's that's how I feel too. Uh, Jeremy says, what are your guys' thoughts on the quick draft format? Does drafting against bots and playing outside of pods uh, pool of cards feel too removed from th from the traditional game? Personally, I primarily play this format, so I don't have uh, to abide by the time restrictions. Does drafting strategy differ much between quick versus traditional? Good questions, Jeremy. Um, my thoughts on quick draft are, sure, if there's a market for it, it should exist, but I don't ever play it. Um, you said just drafting against bots and playing outside pools feel too removed from traditional game. Um, it's close enough to feeling too removed for me to, to enjoy it in the same way that I can drafting against people. Um, look, it just becomes a sub game of what are the bots undervalue? And that isn't that fun to me. And they don't adjust them often enough to make that a dynamic enough thing and if you go back to some of the earlier sets, you know, when, when it was all bots and when the bots weren't as good as they are now, it it was dumb. I mean, it was just you could just get the same deck every single time. It was the best thing. There were some people that didn't know that and didn't do it. But it you never felt incentivized to change directions because it never self-corrected. The bots just were like, these are the cards we value. These are what we value them. At. And you just stick with it. To me, that that takes away a lot of the fun of, of draft is how it changes over time, it just didn't. So that's kind of lame. Um, as far as time restrictions go, I I don't know how, what you mean exactly. I guess if you don't have enough time to do a booster draft, like the actual booster draft portion against humans, because it takes, what, 15 minutes or something? Uh, it might be that during the quick drafts, you don't have a timer per pick. Yeah. So if that's the case, then... And that's what they're referring to. Yeah. So if that's the case, then then sure, you know. But I will say that, you know, once you kind of get used to a set, the time that you get to make picks against other people is pretty... It's a lot. Like, you know, if you, if you know the cards, like if you've drafted a few times and kind of understand the cards, you know, you usually will have a good amount of time once, once you're comfortable. So... And then you can play best of one where the most you're committing to is, is one game at, at a time after that anyway. So if, if it is bigger picture time restrictions, then I think you can get something similar once you're familiar. If you really like to take your time on each pick, then yeah, that, that's going to be the only option for you. But for me, yeah, like I said, if there's a market for it, that's fine. But I'm not really interested in it, uh, it otherwise just because that, that sub game of figuring out what the bots don't value highly enough doesn't really get me going. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm basically in your camp where if people like this, great, they should do it, and it's just, it's not really for me. But I, I I'm not in any way, shape, or form judging anyone who who does like it. Like you should play the modes that are the most fun for you, and hopefully that lines up with the modes other people want to play, and then those modes continue being offered. Right. Um, oops, sorry, I lost it. One second. I just have to bring up the question again, and. There it is from Chris who says, I often do premier drafts on arena. Sometimes it will happen that I feel like the draft went poorly and I'm not happy with my deck, but then I end up going seven Oh and can't quite figure out why the deck worked. What should I be looking for to try to evaluate what I did air quotes, right? This is a bigger picture question, Chris, than, than just uh, an individual draft, which is you always have to, make sure that you're keeping yourself aware of the small sample sizes that we deal with when we look at an individual draft. Um, kind of anything can happen on a draft by draft basis. You can have a deck go really off the rails and still come away with wins because 
you ran a little better than you should have withdrawing, say, the, the better cards in your deck or making your mana work, and maybe you ended up with favorable matchups. Maybe you got matched up against a couple of weak players who, you know, didn't really do much, and then maybe the better players that you got matched up against were a good matchup for what you were trying to do, say, your mana's really bad, you have a powerful stuff but but no fixing, and you get it up against a slow deck where they're actually going to give you the time to do it. These type of things are very um, varied, and on, over the course of one draft, anything goes. So there may not be a lesson for you to learn about what you did right. In fact, you may have done it wrong, <laughs> and you may be completely correct that your deck wasn't very good, but that doesn't mean that you won't experience success sometimes with those decks. So I would try to zoom out one notch if I were you and go, I'm going to try to take some lessons from this, but really not put a high confidence level on those lessons because your instinct's probably correct. Your deck probably wasn't probably wasn't that good. What do you yeah, think? I mean, you, and the results of any given draft really don't give you a ton of clues. Like, sure, sometimes you you know you you do well with a bad deck or do poorly with a good deck. But if your deck has a good curve, if your deck has a lot of removal, like those things can can help. And you're like, oh, this deck is good, but. You could also look to have other people kind of rate what how good they think your deck is without knowing your results. Because, and and one thing I think you could do is try to rate your deck before you play it, so that you think, okay, I think this deck is good, bad, medium, whatever. Because if you try to rate your deck after you play it, you're going to be biased to some degree by how how it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, one thing that you can do, and this is going a bit off the deep end, but it actually can help you learn as well is you can dive deeper into the statistics, right? And and what I mean by that is as human beings, we have to try to interpret um, event the outcome of events. So for example, a game of magic, right? So you win it and you have to interpret that as, okay, then, then I did well or my deck did well or there was a combination of things. But what we can actually do is assign value judgments to those things. Like you can replay the game or think about it while you're playing and go, well, what do I think really happened here, right? And it's like, well, if your opponent got stuck on two lands and, and you were able to easily beat them with your mediocre or bad deck, you know what happened there, right? And so you don't need to just say, well, that's a win for the deck, so it must be good. You can say, no, I got lucky here, or I, you know, it was, it was my opponent's turn to get mana screwed, and therefore I picked up a win. Therefore, I don't really know a lot about my deck still. Next game, well, what happened on this one? And at some point you can go, you know what? I felt like I had answers for everything my opponent was doing. My mana was good. My game plan was consistent and I was able to deploy it and win the game. And you go, well, that's good. That means my deck did exactly what I wanted and it's actually pretty good. And when you see that happen five times in a row where you had good hard fought games, but your deck was able to do what it did and it even led to the win, you know, you can start to really start to think, okay, my deck's actually probably just pretty good. Um, but that's a lot of work. So, you know, you can do that or not. I don't want to read this next one. Uh, Sebastian says, for Marshall, Luis has long said he would announce the end of his limited resources run in a sign-off. <laughs> How worried are you that well, he will use a constructed resources sign-off for that announcement? <laughs> oh, my God. Do you listen to every CR sign-off to make sure that you still have a co-host for that week? No. You know, Sebastian, I choose not to live in fear. <laughs> so you I can't don't. negotiate with terrorists. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> but these freaking table scrappers and their multiple <laughs> sign offs. The, the only good news is, is that like BK comes up with the sign offs over there and then Luis just steals them. So I don't know that there's actually a window for him to do so, but I really wish you wouldn't have said that Sebastian, because that was the kind of thing I didn't worry about before. And, and now I will. So yeah, thanks a lot. I'll be completely honest with you. I had never thought about that, but it actually does <laughs> kind of make it. sense. I knew it. I just should have skipped it. I should have <laughs> just skipped the question, put it out of my head. I was much better off. Next question comes from Angela who says, how would you recommend getting better at best of three? I have a small child, by the way, Angela, I know what it's like to have a small child that you have to look after. Um, I have a small child and usually only have time to play a bit of best of one because it's more flexible time-wise. I'm decent at best of one, but sometimes struggle with best of three, for example, day two of the arena open or the recent draft challenge. I try to play best of three. Uh, sorry, if I try to play best of three, I usually only get one match in and have to wait for the next day for the next match, which kind of hinders me at getting a feel for the deck. Would love your thoughts. Thanks. So Angela, this is... Um, 
I kind of have two thoughts for you. I, I think the first one is that the timing for you to put effort into getting better at best of three doesn't sound uh, correct right now, you know, with, with a small child and stuff, you know, you're probably just going to have to enjoy magic in the, the bite sized chunks that you can get it in. And if that's best of one, then that's best of one. Um, because best of three really is a different beast and it does take, you know, so much longer as you know, but as far as directly to your question about, um, how to get better, you know, I, I try to think of it in there's, there's an obvious thing. And then there's a sort of a less obvious thing. And, and, and I've been playing a lot of best of three lately cause I missed playing it. And I've really, I really like playing it. Um, the obvious thing is sideboarding, right? So you can change your deck around, um, afterwards. The, the default of course is to, uh, bring in cards that are particularly good against what your opponent's doing. That's kind of the obvious sideboarding. But the less obvious sideboarding that's much more relevant in modern era limited when you have so many extra playables on average is that you can change the way your deck operates. For example, if your d deck is a mid-range deck that's sort of leaning towards the late game with, say, a couple of seven or eight drops in there and some ramp spells, and you find that your opponent is playing an all-in aggressive deck, red-white or black-white in this format, and, you know, their one drop, put some counters on it, start beating you down – you know, that's where you can look in your sideboard and go, okay, I already have my cheap removal in, right? I, I wasn't leaving that in the board. But what I could do is I could bring in the two, three for three that I'm not running. I could bring in the one, three for two that I'm not running. And I could cut a couple of the more expensive or superfluous cards that don't affect the board or, or you know, that aren't really what this game, this match is about. And now you're sideboarding for the matchup, not just in the the silver bullet type cards, but you're actually just changing the composure of your deck, um, you know, to accommodate that. And that to me is where you start to get into the bigger picture, which brings us to the, to the less obvious thing with best of three, which is that you also are going to change the way that you play in games two and three, uh, again, accommodating for what you saw in the first game, there's going to be cards, you know, you can write down the relevant cards. If they just play a creature, doesn't have haste or anything. You don't need to write it down necessarily. But if they play a combat trick, if they play a counter spell, if they play uh, instant speed removal spells, if they play creatures with haste, if they play, you know, threaten effects that steal your creatures, that kind of stuff, you can just write those down as you see them come out. And by game three, you often have seen a lot of your opponent's deck. And while you may not have answers for those cards to sideboard in specifically, you can tailor your game plan for what your opponent's doing. And that to me is the place where you get the most equity. You know, if you watch Luis stream, you know, you'll see he, he'll play differently in game one than he would in, in, in game three, because he knows more about the deck and what he can get away with and what he can't. And that to me is, is where you can get the most, uh, the most equity. What do you think about it, Luis? First of all, off the top, I certainly agree with uh, you that, you know, from, from the start, if you don't if you don't have t uh, time to consistently play best of three, I wouldn't stress about it. You, you, you'll you be fine just honing your skills in best of one and you're not going to lose that much in translation because there are edges to be gained, certainly. Uh, but you're, you're not playing a you're not playing a different game. Best of one and best of three magic. Like if you l had me like watch a game with, that someone was playing or play a game. And I didn't, you didn't tell me it was which game it was, best of, best of one, best of three, game one, two, game game three. I wouldn't really be able to tell. There's no obvious differentiator there. And I think that that's, you know, that, that's a good sign for people who don't really have time to devote to best of three. Just play best of one and you're going to get plenty of good practice. The, the, the second thing, though, is you, it does open the door in best of three to, to make some kind of different plays. Like an example I could use is uh, if you're in game three and you know your opponent's got two Lash of Mouths, Sometimes you just don't play a blood researcher on turn three. Mm -hmm. And you would never do that in a best of one game. Right. You don't even know what's in their deck. But once you know they have two la copies of Lash of Malice, like, yeah, maybe you just skip a turn playing a drop so you, they don't get to kill your high value creature for free. And that's the kind of thing you can pick up. So in, in some ways, like, you can get a lot of extra value by doing it. But on the other hand, I wouldn't stress about not 
getting not getting enough practice in because ultimately the lessons you learn in best of one are still going to carry over. But if you really want to get that extra edge, then yeah, go go you know go go play some best of three, and uh, that way you'll be better suited for like say day two of the arena open. Yeah, a good litmus test for it, Angela, uh, for what what we were talking about with uh, changing your the way that you play, not just the cards in your deck, is are you right? Is it game two and you're just on autopilot playing the exact same way you would um, against an unknown deck? Or are you actually taking into consideration what your opponent has? So there you go. Good luck with it. And good luck with the kid. Josh says, Marshall, have you ever considered doing commentary for another game or eSport? Um, not really. I guess I would, I don't know. It would have to be something I was really into. That's the hard part is that like when you do commentary, there's kind of two styles, I guess. There's one, which is kind of what you see is what you get, which is how I do it. And then there's kind of the, I don't know, faking it's a little too strong of a term, but that that type of thing where you're just like, yeah, I can commentate anything, you know, throw me in the booth. You know, like when I get excited about stuff in the booth because I'm actually excited about it. And I, you know, if I was commentating a game I didn't really care about that much, I don't think I'd be that excited about it. It'd be hard for me to to kind of get going. That said, I, I do like just, I do like just doing commentary. So if I found something that I really loved, then I would do it. So um, it looks like there's a there's a follow up question here of uh, which magic commentators do you think belong to the second group, uh, with the the feigned excitement and the <laughs> oh I have them they're all up here in my head you know who they are they they exist uh, there is actually a follow up question from Josh since I can see it and you can't uh, what would be your dream commentary gig outside of MTG obviously the NBA I would absolutely love to commentate the NBA um, and then. Josh says, P.S. I absolutely love Wristwatch Revival. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. There it is. That's my dream gig. Commentating myself, restoring vintage timepieces. I got there. Um, Timofey says, Luis, as a profound enthusiast of delicious food, which regional cuisine do you prefer as something to eat daily? And which one do you find most intriguing? Uh, when it comes to something daily that honestly, I mean, I, I say this as we, you know, in our, in our pre-show, it was me eating like just a, a bowl of peppers and refried beans. Cause that's like, a, <laughs> like, a, like I'll have for lunch sometimes mm-hmm. I got those like, you know, grilled peppers from the farmer's market. They sell in those bags. Oh yeah. And so I just, yeah, I just heat it up and bam, uh, Mex- Mexican uh, food is something that I go to a lot. Like just because basically the combination of like beans, meat, avocados, vegetables, salsa, it's just like hits all the notes I want, you know, I, I and yeah. so on a consistent basis, I do eat that and, uh, and, you know, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. The most intriguing, intriguing is an interesting word because like I've, I think done a pretty good job of exploring a lot of the different options. So I don't know if intriguing, intriguing kind of Im, implies some kind of mystery I have yet to, to unpack, but mm-hmm. one that I've talked about before, which I, I find to be, uh, excellent is uh, Ethiopian food, and it's you no, know, not something I have every every day or even every week. But it it, it is a, a quite the awesome meal when you find a good place and you get to like you know everything comes with that injera bread, and you use that to like scoop up the the various like kind of like curried meats and vegetables and lentils and and, and what have you. Yeah, you're gonna take me, right? Yeah, at some point we will definitely go. You're gonna. I guess we get mind. to travel again. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Um, next is from mm, sword who says, got a favorite dish you always order out, but would, but never, but would never make it home. And then alternative have something you made at home, but never gain. What does that mean? Maybe never again, or I'm not sure what M sword is asking exactly there on that second question, but is there a favorite dish that you, uh, that you order out, but you never make it home, Luis? I know I got one for myself, but or two, um, I guess for me, uh, Sushi. I've never made sushi myself, and mm-hmm. and I, I, you know, sushi rolls are are awesome. Like I, I really enjoy them quite a bit. So that's something that I feel like is like a kind of cool treat, which I is would be difficult, or at least isn't something I've tried to make. Yeah, you know, for me, it's um two somewhat similar dishes, which is pho and ramen. Um, oh yeah, good, yeah, and good, it's mainly because it's a broth, right? Like th- it takes a really long time to make a really good broth for either of those soups, and um, and it's pretty complicated process that, you know, requires like, you know, bones and then like switching stuff around and then a whole bunch of ingredients to make them really like a complex broth. The other stuff's not that bad noodles and the ingredients. I could do that part. No problem. But I've never even, 
uh, tried to to make that type of broth at home. I think it would just stink up the place anyway, so I wouldn't do that. Um, something I've made at home but wouldn't order out for? I think maybe something you've made at home but wouldn't try making again. I think that's, that, oh, that's what Oh, is that what that is? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I've had some failures. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. Uh, but I, so that's probably true, but I don't know. I probably would make any of the things that I've made before again. I, I can't imagine trying to make a dish and failing and then just throwing in the towel. <laughs> mm-hmm. like yeah, I, that's I, right. I, 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 would, I, would, I, would, I would try to go in for a, for a second bite at the apple there. Definitely. Um, Andre says, can you explain a little why Barry in books is better than Frost Trickster? I get that Barry removes the creature from play longer and they have to respend the mana. But Frost Trickster adds a body to the board and can attack in the air and block. I know Barry is better, but I, I think understanding this would help me level up. I think there's a well. There's a couple of things going on. One is Barry and books it, it, is a one for one, right? Because you removed a creature from the board and they, they get to redraw it, but you still took a card out of play. Like they have to spend a draw step on it again. Mm-hmm. Frost Trickster is only a one for one <clears throat> if you're able to trade the two two for something. And one of the reasons that Barry, I think, is is, is quite a bit better than Frost Trickster. I don't, I don't actually think it's close. Is two two flyers aren't yeah they're not like the best thing ever it's gonna it's gonna trade some of the time for sure but some of the time it it doesn't do what what you need it to do right some of the time it doesn't it doesn't get the job done and if you're not able to trade it for something then you're you're still down a a card at that point or at least this card isn't doing that much for you burying books works against creatures of any size like they have yep. a 10 10 fractal you bury in books it's gone forever you know they you bury in books a 3 3 it's gone and sometimes it you, it's great you bury in books a eager first year on turn 3 uh just so they redraw it you don't really even care about getting it off the board but you got to trade your 3 mana for their 2 mana but then they also skip their draw step especially on a turn where you probably don't have anything else you could be doing anyway frost trickster is can be good defensively, can be good offensively. It's still a good card. But I think it's the main thing is, is it just does not work nearly as well against larger sized creatures. Whereas Barian Books basically guarantees uh, a one for one trade. And sometimes it gets rid of a creature for good because there's so many creature tokens. Yeah. So unless you're doing a really good job of lever- leveraging the 2 2 flyer, Barian Books is going to perform better for you. And I think it overall does. Yeah. What you said at the end there about the how many creature tokens there are in the format is, is really a game changer for, for Barry and books. Cause it just outright kills things that cost five, six, seven, eight mana pretty consistently. Um, Travis says, uh, since you have commented on strict save and being an all time great sealed format, what do you think makes a good sealed format? Hmm. I think that there, there's a couple of things that make a good sealed format. Um, I think good enough mana fixing to play, three colors, but not always three colors, I think is, is nice. Like Strixhaven gives you the opportunity to play three, four, even five colors if you really wanted to, but not every pool does. Some of the pools don't. And I think that that adds a good amount of variation. Having a lot of extra rares actually, I think has found it to be, to be an an enjoyable thing because it, Mm -hmm. it, it kind of evens it out a little bit too, where, you know, imagine in the world where you only open one rare, the people who have a good rare versus the people who don't, it's much of a bigger disparity than if you open three rares or six rares or nine rares. And of course, it starts to break down at some point where there's too many and then then every every game's about that. But I think Strixhaven hits a good spot of how many rares you open. The other thing is the rares are exciting, they're powerful, but the removal is, is good enough, the answers are good enough that these rares are generally beatable, you know, the double mascot exhibitions aside. So you're... you're <laughs> You're able to have a lot of good counterplay. And then like lesson, I think, is is pretty nice. Like that is just specifically a mechanic that I think plays pretty well in sealed by giving you this core of cards that you can fit into a lot of your different decks and then a lot of ways to find them. And then, you know, different ways to build your decks to maximize those lessons. And I guess put all that together and Strixhaven is one where the deck building is interesting. The games are interesting. You get to play with some sweet rares. But the rares are also not just like completely o- overly dominant. Yeah, the, the, I think the things that I take away from that that I like to see are good fixing, good removal, and uh, basically an open. I, I want to have options. 
that that's what I want. I want things that are good, good early, good late. I want good fixing and I want the removal to be able to keep up with the rares. And if those things are there, then I think the seal is probably going to be pretty good. Um, Kyle says, I always love the food sign offs and I want to have a better collection of everyday dishes. Uh, what are your go-to meals to quickly throw together for your households? One for me that, that uh, is, is pretty easy is just making like a kind of like chili lime marinade, which is just like uh, lime juice, some olive oil, soy sauce, and then whatever spices you like, you know, whether that's like paprika, chili powder, salt, pepper, uh, you know, cayenne pepper and, and chipotle powder, any of those things. You throw some chicken or steak in that for, you know, for steak, I would I would recommend using like skirt steak or like, some, you know, a carne asada type steak. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put like a ribeye in that. Like, I think those are best cooked without with the minimum amount of stuff uh -huh. on them. But like, you know, especially, especially if you're talking easy meals, you toss some chicken breasts in there. You let them sit for like half an hour even. And then you just throw them on the grill or throw them on, you know, a saute pan or even or bake them in the oven. Super easy. You can roast almost any vegetable if you roast it with like some sort of fat, like olive oil, I think is a pretty good one. Um, and mm -hmm. some, some seasonings, you know, and you just roast it. It just comes out great. It just always comes out great. Like mm -hmm. roasted asparagus, roasted broccoli, roasted Brussels sprouts. Like it's kind of like a cheat code, you know, you, you just is. do that and, and, it, and it's just really good. Those are some of the like pretty fast, you know, like, Hey, we're hungry. What are we going to do? Uh, sort of meals for me. Yeah. For me, uh, the two go-tos, one of them spaghetti, which I know is a little boring, but you know, if you take a little time to do it right, it can be really good. And you don't have to make it from scratch. Like you can get a jar of the spaghetti sauce. I've been getting the kind of the more expensive one lately. Cause I found it like, it actually is a lot better. Um, and you can get two batches out of it too. So it's not actually that bad as far as money goes. And then of course, yeah, the, the, the two halves of the podcast live differently. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're roasting vegetables and having steak and I'm making spaghetti. And then I'll, uh, and then I'll, what I'll do is brown up some ground beef and then, uh, you know, the, the tricks to make sure that your pasta comes out good are use a lot of salt in the water. Um, it'll season the pasta, but when you drain off the water, it's, it's not going to be super salty. So you don't have to worry about that. You have to use more salt than you probably think you do. Um, and then the, the big key though, like what I used to not do and what I do now, you know, is you drain off basically all of the water and then with just a little tiny bit left, and then you put the spaghetti back into the pot that you boiled in and put it back on the, on the stove again. But this time put the heat from high down to like say medium. And then you put the sauce in there and then you stir it up and cook it just again for another like maybe a minute and a half or two minutes. And it just brings it all together rather than like putting noodles on a plate and then pouring sauce on top of them. Um, two good things happen. One, the sauce gets heated up with the noodles so that it's, it, it's not like you have cold sauce on top of hot noodles. And then also it all gets integrated together uh, in a much better way. Um, so I definitely recommend doing that. And then, you know, you can just have something simple with it, bread or, you know, some toasted bread or, or, you know, a salad or something like that to go with it. And that's dinner. And then the other one I like to do, uh, Luis and I both like to grill a lot. That's like a big thing for us. And, uh, you know, chicken breast, right? Just, you can just go get some chicken breast, just trim it up. You can put it in a bowl with some garlic, salt, pepper, olive oil. Like you don't have to do anything crazy. Um, and then just, I like to, to cut the chicken breast in half lengthwise so that they're thinner, or you can use a, uh, the bottom of a pan, or if you have one of those mallet things to kind of flatten it out. And, and the ideal is to, to get it so that it's even, you don't want like a big thick part and then a little tiny part because then it's really hard to cook it evenly. But if you, if the each piece is is a roughly uniform size, then it'll cook more evenly on the grill. And you just throw those on the grill, and then you know maybe you can do some some broccoli with it or something like that, like what Louise said, and and that's dinner too. And and those are super basic and 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 pretty darn good. Um. Oh, this is good. He all, Kyle also says, what would be your pack one pick one if you saw the following spices and herbs. Uh, anise, basil, basil, as they say, cinnamon, ginger, peppermint, saffron, turmeric, or wasabi. I'm going for ginger. Yeah, I, I probably would go saffron because it's just like a surefire way to make an amazing dish. But it is. It's, it's also a, it's a bit of a cheat code. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, there's a reason it's worth seven thousand dollars a, a, a an ounce or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so but, Louise uh, going for the expensive one. Yeah. Okay. I get mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but but yeah, and I like ginger. You know, the truth is that ginger on its own is rarely the way it goes. But ginger in combination with garlic, for example, is fantastic. I can I can uh, make a, a ton of stuff on my wok. I've got a wok set up, and I use it all the time. Um, in fact, there's another one for you, Kyle. I make an, an egg dish, which is just, it's like a hash. It's just super basic. It's like two or three eggs. But what I do is I make bacon in it first, like two pieces and then take the bacon out and then the bacon renders out and that's plenty enough, um, to, to cook the rest of the ingredients in. And then it's just like some potatoes, some onions. I like to use bell pepper, some mushrooms, some spinach, and then whatever else you happen to have laying around. And then I use a, a seasoning that I really like, um, it's a non-salt seasoning, but it has a mix of different stuff in it. And then you you can just uh, put the eggs in last and then mix that all together. And that's a nice little meal too. Um, a little life hack. C- cook mm-hmm. your eggs less time than you do now. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. I, I, I know. No, I'm not talking to you, Marshall. I'm talking about the podcast as mm-hmm. a whole. Everyone just overcooks eggs, especially if you – I remember like having eggs at like – you know, uh, when I when I went out and like had them at like, uh, you know, you're like kind of hotel continental breakfast sort of deals. Like mm-hmm. that that that's exactly the like the way you shouldn't cook eggs, and they do it because they're cooking like a lot in bulk, and you know that you know they're not they're half the time not even using real eggs or whatever. But in general, that's one of the things that I realized much much later than I should have that like you can cook eggs for a lot less time than you think, and they can be really delicious. Mm-hmm. I'm getting hungry. Uh, Max says, your limited deck can contain only basic land and multiple copies of any one common from Magic's history. What common do you choose to battle with in this hypothetical format? And what are the pillars of the metagame? I mean, Sprout Swarm is pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, Sprout Swarm would be tough to beat. Is is there an argument for Lightning Bolt? No, right? Because you'd end up drawing a bunch of lands and it wouldn't work. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to yeah, – a lightning bolt might – this is like one of those like three-card Monty, like how do you build these the three-card blind or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, th- you'd have to do the math, but it's possible that like, you know, lightning bolts will get you there faster than Sprout Swarm can kill you or whatever. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm i having trouble thinking of what, what would be the, the natural trump to any of these things. Yeah, I just want to put a bunch of Mana Wars in my deck, but I have to rely that my opponent is also playing a creature or else it doesn't <laughs> work at all. They they bounce each other. Um, oh, I, the, the answer is obviously just a cold, the Cold Snap Surge cards, like Surging Flame. You just play, oh. you know, a, the two mana deal two or whatever with Surge or, or Ripple or whatever, or like Surging Sentinels. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah yeah okay there you go well that 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 went from kind of interesting to not not that interesting uh Alex says in some sealed pools I find myself quickly limited to only a couple of color combinations that allow me to assemble my desired number of twelve to fifteen playable creatures potentially leaving solid non bomb rares or premium commons in the sideboard am I being overly inflexible with the heuristic how can I judge when I shoot for uh, a medium flat power curve deck versus one that's spiky either in mana or card quality. I think you actually are being a little too inflexible there, Alex. I, I, I'm a lot more willing to play fewer creatures in sealed, for example, where um, it's less likely that I'm going to be ran over by my opponent. You know, one of the best ways to not get ran over is by having creatures on the battlefield because, you know, magic tends to uh, benefit the defensive player. And if you have, you know, one three three can blank two two twos, for example, if they don't have an answer. And in sealed, that doesn't happen as often. So I'm more willing to aim for higher power level with with less of the sort of normal heuristics that I'd hope to stick to for like a draft deck, for example. So I think you should actually loosen that up a bit. One of the things that I think is not helpful as you're trying to get to like the next level of understanding is thinking you need a specific number of creatures. There's no there's no number. Like you don't need 10, you don't need 12, you don't need 14. It just kind of depends on does your deck have enough good defensive early plays if you're not an aggressive deck? If it's an aggressive deck, does it have enough two drops? Like aggro decks are a little more constrained. It would be hard to make an aggro aggro deck with eight creatures, for example. Uh, If you're, you know, playing a control deck, do you have good finishers? Like you can build a great control deck in this format with like six creatures in it. Yeah. You can also build a great control deck with like 15 creatures in it. It There's no... 
there's no specific number. And I think that if you aim for a number, you're just doing yourself a disservice. Like if you, if, if you, if your best two colors that let you play all your best cards has, uh, you know, is a deck that has something like nine, eight or nine creatures, that's totally fine. I wouldn't even consider that, that atypical. Like you can just end up there. You do have to make sure you've got like, you know, a lash of malice or two or a flunk. And then like two copies of rise of Exodus and like enough ways to like kill their stuff. Cause they, they will also be playing creatures, but you really don't need, you know, with 13 creatures to make your deck. That's just not, not, not really a useful metric to, that should guide your deck building uh, decisions. Right. Um, Trini says, uh, I haven't listened in a while. LGS magic wasn't happening and I don't like online play. Now the stores are opening. What did I miss? Which sets should I be asking LGS to host limited events? What was the best pandemic limited set the worst? My, in my opinion, the best is Strixhaven. I've, I've enjoyed Same. it more than the other recent ones. You can't really go wrong with the last year of sets. I think I would probably skip Aquaria because of the whole cycling Xena flare thing. Like that's, it's just a little bit warping, and especially if you're not prepared for that, it's I think gonna gonna end up being a little unpleasant. But I, I would just go for Strixhaven, honestly. I think Strixhaven is a lot of fun. I would too. Same. Um, Matthew Sperling, who says not that Matt Sperling. <laughs> uh, I found that uh, as I found that when I'm drafting Silver Quill, that some versions want to be hyper streamlined aggro, play 16 lands, and top out at an Owl and Shield Mage, while others are okay grinding and want to close out games with value from Rise of Extus. Going into pack three, what should I be looking for in my deck to pick between premium beatdown cards like Study Break versus Combat Professor, uh, Professor or Rise? It's hard to, to answer that in, two, like in a general terms because, you know, it, it's... There's no like, ah, well, if you have if you have two copies of a Silver Cool Apprentice, you should be aggro. Or if you have two copies of Rise of Extus, you should be control. But in general, like, it's funny. So like about 15 cards will be the same in either of these builds. You know, the, you're, you're still going to play your good removal spells and your good creatures that cost like two to four mana. And then it's just the margins that where, where these things change, where the control deck has maybe another five mana spell and two six mana spells and you know, another removal spell or, or learn card. The aggro deck has a couple more two drops and a steady break. In general, try to play the deck that has the overall highest card quality. I don't think Silver Quill needs to be one or the other. And that's one of the strengths of Silver Quill. I guess if if it's really like tied in dead heat, I'd rather be an aggressive deck. And you, know, you, you might think like, wow, you always like drafting control. It's like, well, I do like doing that, but... When, when my goal is to win, I'll draft whatever I think is going to win me the most. And if your goal is to win and that's what you're trying to optimize for, I think that good aggro decks tend to be better than good control decks. It's just hard to get good aggro decks because they're a little less forgiving. If you miss your curve, you know, that the, the window closes and you, it's going to be hard for you to win. And good control decks, you know, are obviously great too, but Good aggro decks can really destroy the, the the control decks that aren't prepared for them. And one thing that I think comes up a lot is the ways to make your deck better against other control decks make you tend to make you weaker against aggro decks. Mm -hmm. The more negates people are putting in their Quandrix decks, the weaker they're going to get against your strategy of playing a bunch of two drops and, and and curving out because negates just not a good card in that in that world. You know, cards like you know. Uh, creative expression that like deal five look at your top five cards like great card when you're playing against a control deck not very good against aggro because it's paying seven mana to kill a creature that costs three mana like sure you get to draw an extra card but you're probably near dead by then so biasing you know towards aggro when you've got access to either i, I don't think is like a terrible strategy just in general though whatever seems like it's going to give you the highest card quality i think is a good way to, to go down like if they're both open, aggro can be really good because a lot of people are gonna are gonna struggle against it. But you know, I would rather I would rather be the deck that has two two copies of Rise of Exodus than oh well, I have a study break, so I'm gonna play a bunch of eager first years. You know, that's mm -hmm. just 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 play your good cards if you can. Play your good cards, yeah. Um, Princess Boggy says, "Hi, Marshall and Luis. Two Strixhaven inspired questions for you. The first question is." If you were both teachers at a magical academy, what would you teach? Draft? <laughs> uh, Introduction to draft? I, 
I, I would say advanced strategy and tactics and, uh, mm. you know, the alchemical cooking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> the second one is a little more rooted in the real world. What do you think of the concept of official MTG qualifications? I, for one, would love to take a sealed exam, for example. Thanks for all the content, Jasmine. <laughs> so you have to like, you you could have like a, a resume basically that said like, I passed the sealed test. I'm a level four sealed player. Is that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, a professional certification or something like yeah, that. Where It would be fun. Where, that, that would be fun. Yeah, I, I think that'd be cool. I mean. Everyone loves taking tests that yeah. uh, that that can help prove that they're good at things. Yes. So yeah. I could definitely see the appeal here. Yeah, as long as people didn't take it too seriously, it could be fun. Uh, Spania says, in our friend group, we often cannot get eight people for a draft. How is drafting with six people different? Would you change the structure of the draft, like number of packs, picks per pack, to accommodate for the difference? And how about four-player draft? Uh, Spawny, a six player draft is fantastic. Uh, in fact, I think you could make an arg some arguments that it's better than eight player. Um, especially because of the way that, uh, matching up and determining who wins goes, uh, you know, the, the favored way to play when you have six people. And this is often, again, even if you have access to eight people will play this way is to draft as normal. So draft the best deck you can, the normal way you would. And then after the draft's over, split into two randomly assigned three person teams. Then you can help each other build your decks just in case you want an, an extra opinion or something like that. And then you very simply play one match against each other player on the team. So three rounds total, you swap each time. And then that way you've played a total of nine matches and there must be a winner at that point. So the first team to get to five wins takes down the little event. If you want to throw in something, you know, it's, it's common, for example, for people to play for the cards that were opened. Um, and then those get distributed to the three players who won. If you like to play for stakes, if not, you don't have to, you can just draft your deck, um, and, and play. Um, so yeah, that's great. Of course, the other thing, and Luis, I want you to cover this one is make a team draft. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy team drafting quite a bit. So one, one of the ways that we used to like, kind of d decide which to do is if we we're testing for an event let's say a pro tour that had draft because you know in the days of yours such things existed mm -hmm. uh you, you we would do draft like you said as normal trying to get the best deck you can not trying to uh draft in any sort of like team draft centric way and uh we would do teams after because i think that 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 gives you the team experience where one of the one of the cool things about this that you didn't mention is it it also makes deck building more of a team experience where everyone lays out their decks. And that's one of the things I've kind of missed a little when we've done the LR versus LOL showdowns is it's a lot harder to do that over over Discord. like the internet yeah. than or Discord than it is in person. And then and then everyone lays out their decks and your teammates will be like, because you you'll you'll know kind of what you drafted. Like, look, I drafted blue black, but they'll give you advice on the last couple cuts, or hey, I think you should splash this red card. And that gives you a lot more understanding too, because not only are you getting help with your deck or helping with other people's decks, you're also getting to look at what other people drafted and what their takes on the format are. And there's a lot that uh, you can get from that. I think that that's that can be a really valuable experience. And then if you if you really want to have some some, some you know t team action here, do a team draft. Do a three on three where you determine the teams beforehand and alternate. So you know if me, you, and Jeff, for example, we're, we're going to take on say uh, Dennis, Riley, and Mashi. First of all, it'd be a landslide. It wouldn't even be close. Let's uh, do second, that. By the way, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, second, you know, you really you really want to get some uh, some Washington Generals versus the Harlem Glo Globetrotters action, but. Uh, <laughs> We would we would alternate, so it would be like Team A, then Team B, then Team A, then Team B, then Team A, then Team B, and you know you're passing to the enemy, and you know that they're passing to you, and you you know you you just have to decide how to draft based on that, and that's really cool. It's a lot of fun. It's not going to like be practiced for normal drafts on arena or what have you, but if not everything has to be practiced for something. Right, and then the last question from Spania was, how about a four player draft? And I would recommend against those, generally speaking. You can do them, but the number, the total number of packs opened is so small that it can be difficult to get any type of like tribal or cumulative type strategies going. And uh, I found that 
six is really the sweet spot. I actually prefer it to eight in, in most scenarios. Um, but yeah, so I, I would avoid four. I would definitely do six. And when you can get eight, sure, sure, do eight. And again, I think the best way to do it is to do teams after and just put something up. Everybody throws in a pack. That just makes it a lot more uh, interesting, at least uh, for, for people like me. Um, Martin says, hi, guys. Firstly, thanks for the awesome show. You're welcome, Martin. Uh, I love the chemistry between Marshall and LSV. Boy, we do fake it pretty good, don't we, Luis? Oh, yeah. Um, I've enjoyed the review of the older sets, Homelands for the win. So I hope you guys will continue those. We will. In fact, um, TBS uh, has recently moved here to Seattle. So now uh, I guess it doesn't really change anything. But at least it's not, you know, <laughs> he's not nine time zones over or whatever. Uh, so we'll get to continue those. He says, I'm a long-term Magic player, but only recently realized how awesome Draft is. And then he says, how dumb is that? And Yeah, where have you been, Martin? The Draft's been here the whole time, buddy. Um, I would love to be able to draft one of these older sets and uh, have to scramble for playables. LSV, do you miss those days or is modern era draft just superior in your view? Oh, I definitely miss those days. And we were talking about this earlier uh, before the show. I, I think uh, I think there's something there. I'm still kicking it around. But I, I think I might, you know, now that we're talking about team drafts and older sets, the fact that you can use a uh, third-party website like uh, the, the the MTGA uh, app on Heroku to draft means you could just draft an older set and then play it out on like say Magic Online. Mm. So, you know, there might be some like Invasion Plane Shift Apocalypse three-on-three drafts in my future. We'll see. You know what? Mm. I think that Limited's in a better place now and I think that more people have more fun when you're not scrambling for playables. There was something to having 18 playables and trying to figure out Okay, I guess I can play 19 lands. What are my last three cards going to be? And like putting some real stinkers in because this is, you know, to to veer into game design talk a little, being kind of forced to play with things you wouldn't normally want to play with can be a lot of fun. This is why this is part of why uh, lessons can be fun. Like, you know, the lessons are bad, right? Like rate wise, they're bad. Mm -hmm. Three mana, three, five mana, four, four. But you have, you know, this opportunity to play with them because the less well, the learn cards are quite good. Like the overall package is good uh, to, to to look at something uh, like Hearthstone. You have discover where you look at you discover and you look at three random cards and choose one to play with. And that's a cool digital mechanic because you end up playing with cards that you wouldn't normally play with or put in your deck. And that that can be a lot of fun being it being right to play with these things can be sweet. And one of the cool things about the old draft formats is you really got to find out how bad five mana, three, three with a slight drop. <laughs> yeah. Is, you know, <laughs> and, you, know you got to know those, inter- those uh, subtleties real well. And, and, and that sort of thing can be cool it, as long as you don't overdo it. Of course, you know, you right. don't want to end up in a spot where, you know, that that's all that's happening. And those drafts, I think this is part of why the new, the, the more modern sets are better is like, those draft sets can be pretty frustrating if you don't know what's going on and you're and you, you you're not sure how to which cards are good and then you end up playing a bunch of really bad cards and look the power level differential between the players who knew what was going on and the players who didn't was like pretty wide. That's not the case in modern limited. Like you know you you, you fire up arena after this Marshall and you go draft and you go play uh, in the best of one queue or whatever. Your opponents are just not going to play a bunch of bad cards in their deck because it's just really hard to do that. Yeah, you play in these old formats, your opponent plays some cards, and you just knew on turn one, oh, I'm going to win this match. Yeah, and yeah, look, winning can be fun. I understand that, but overall, I think that it is more fun than when everyone has, you know, kind of like a, the the floor is is higher across the board, and then you get to beat someone based on outthinking them and out strategizing them, not. Yeah, you know, I really know that like the, the this this flyer you took is just really not a good card, and you you're, you didn't you didn't know that, right? Yeah, you know how it is when sometimes we look back at things and they they we kind of romanticize them, but then when you actually do it, you're like, eh, this wasn't quite as cool as I thought. Um, <clears throat> next Except question. IPA draft, IPA draft is there. You go. <laughs> <laughs> next next question comes from uh, Matt Schneeweiss, my buddy, who says, "Hey, Marshall and LSV." I'm going to use a great question I heard, uh, which happens to parallel a question that should be asked after every game of Magic. The question is, what will you do differently next pandemic? In other words, what did you learn about yourself or about the world from going through COVID-19 and all the changes that wrought in your life? And how will this impact your practical decision making next time it looks like something similar is on the horizon? Ooh, Matt went deep. 
Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like thinking about there being a next pandemic in the sense that, like, you know, I, I just hope that that's not the case because that 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 would that would suck. But what would I do differently if we were if we had a similar situation? Um, I would certainly spend time making my living area nicer, faster. Like I did mm. end up doing this. You know, I did end up like we basically set up an entire office upstairs. So. When I'm, you know, when I'm streaming or recording, I'm here because this is my office. But I've kind of like second office set up upstairs that's much more pleasant. It's got a lot more light, and I spent a lot more time up there because we, you know, now with the pandemic, we're we're, uh, you know, spending time indoors. I uh, would definitely kind of invest in 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 ways to like make cooking more enjoyable, and, and you know, that's something that like at times I was able to do a good job of, and at times. You know, we had a, did a, good, a less good job of and a lot more ordering food, but it kind of just depends on where you're at in any given time. And I think overall, I would just yeah try, try my best to uh, connect with other people and find out ways to to connect with them. I've been doing a lot more phone calls over the pandemic, and I didn't start that till kind of later. Didn't start going on those long walks till like later. I, I wish I'd done all that stuff earlier. It, it has been a great help, even if we're kind of pulling out of it at this point. Luckily, you know, at least at least where I am, but. If I had been doing those things earlier, I think I would be a little healthier and a little happier. So yeah. that's something to take in mind. Yeah, you know, for me, it, it's it's been really eye opening about um, kind of the the things that you take for granted in your day to day life that help you stay kind of centered and, I mean, more or less happy or relevant to other things. Um, you know, I think that like the lifestyle I had pre pandemic was already cutting it pretty close with traveling all the time, having a extent, the majority of my social circle be not at home. Um, and then being gone a lot for a lot of important things on weekends and stuff, you know, further pushed my, my social circle outwards. And then when it disappeared, like the next day, it's like, well, you're not going to get to see, like, I haven't seen Luis in over a year. Right. And like, that hasn't happened in 10, you <laughs> know, since I've known him. Th thanks, thanks to these organized play changes that might, well, we'll see each other, but you know, yeah. will, will either, will either of us ever see Paulo again? Right. It's a legit question. Right. And it's an like, actual question. you know, like, you know, Luis and we saw and I the guy are, five, mm -hmm. four times a year for the last decade. Minimum. And, and, you know, with Minimum. GPs and stuff, it was more right. And, you know, and it's just like, you know, there, there's a group of people that are like your friends, but like you can maintain the level of friendship you had, even if you don't happen to see them. But, you know, like with people like you and I, like we talk every day anyway, but like, you know, I haven't seen you. You know, It's weird, right? Because like I normally would have gone out to dinner, hung out with you. We share a hotel room. We cover an event together. We go do some, you know, there, that type of stuff would have happened. And so, you know, for me, that stuff just happened. Like I didn't, you know, it was like part of my work social cycles that I had had and then they disappeared. And I was like, oh, those are really important. Like I don't, I haven't cultivated enough of those at home and I don't know how sustainable it was to keep doing the traveling and all that type of thing anyway. So for me, I've realized that with the lifestyle that I've chosen with regards to my career, which is you know, working from home and, and not having like an office type job anymore. Those things don't just appear for you. You have to build them, right? This is part of the reason why I started streaming once a week. I wanted something that involved other people that I would be accountable to be there for every week. And it was just one day a week that's, and I've, but I've done it ever since I did that. And I've really liked doing it, not just because I like streaming, but also it's because there's going to be people there and I have to be there. When I was in school and when I had normal jobs, that just happens. You don't have to think about it. It's like, I got to go to school today. And then there's other people around. And then you fit yourself into that group of people and you meet new people. And, you know, it just sort of happens. But there are at least, you know, for me and the way that my life has gone, that doesn't just happen for me anymore. I have to actually do that. I didn't understand that fully at the beginning of the pandemic. And I would be more proactive about that um, now. Also, my expectations would be a lot different. Two biggest things I think that stand out for me are one, um, I didn't realize the mental load that being in a pandemic would bring. It's like a background, like carrying a backpack full of rocks or something. It, it's not the type of thing that necessarily knocks you down 
you know, where let's say you experience a big loss in your life or something and it just knocks you down and you have a really hard time getting up. It's more just like I'm carrying a level of stress or anxiety or whatever it is about the pandemic stuff. And so then when other life stuff happens, you don't have as much in reserve to, to handle it. And I don't think I, I remember feeling fine for the first month and a half or whatever the pandemic because I'm like, well, this isn't so bad. I can work on this stuff. I don't have to travel as much like this will be fine. But I wasn't fine and I didn't know it. And then I kind of just crashed out and I was like, what is going on with me? And it was because like the pandemic was really a big deal and I didn't really recognize it. And then any other life stuff that came along was enough to just knock me down. And, and now I would understand, even if you don't feel it acutely every minute, you are carrying a bigger emotional load than you recognize. And you need to be aware of that uh, and take care of yourself accordingly. The other expectations change I would have is... Uh, <laughs> The expectations on my fellow human being, um, you know, I've just had to say, I, at some point I had to kind of disconnect from the outrage of seeing how other people handle the pandemic and say, I need to do the, I need to live the way I'm going to live for this pandemic because I feel that it's the right thing to do and not for any other reason. Because if I couple it to other stuff, I can't hand, I, I can't stand it. When in the middle of the pandemic, it's like, hey, look, there's a club and there's a bunch of people in there and they just don't care. Right. And I'm just like, I, it drove me nuts. Also, with the amount of information that we get from the air quotes authorities, they don't know a lot of stuff and they're doing the best they can to react and do their things. So I'm not going to sit here and wait for an authority to say, this is exactly how this works and this is how this is going to go. I'm going to do the best I can with the information I have. And I was very conservative about all of this stuff. Um, I feel like the things that we are asked to do, some of it was tough, but a lot of it wasn't. And I'd rather just do it to play it safe. And then when I know for sure that it's, it's okay, then I'll undo it. I, you know, with mask wearing, with visiting people, even when they started to loosen restrictions, I'm like, I'm just not going to do that yet because I, I think we can, I think I can wait and I'll be fine to wait. And, uh, I would continue to do that rather than trying to, uh, rely too much on other, uh, entities in that way because they don't know either. And until we get to hindsight, you know, where we get a month or two away, then we know how it was back then, but we don't really know how, how it is, uh, at any given moment. Good question, Matt. I think we all learned a lot from the thing. Ben says, love the show, y'all. Luis, any Memorial Day weekend food plans? I'm planning on making a big barbacoa nacho platter for a cookout. Marshall, uh, when you got into wristwatch revival as a hobby, what was most daunting? Often hobbies like that uh, feel like looking over the edge of a cliff with the amount of time and or money that can be easily dumped into them without even realizing. You go first, Luis. Were you cooking anything special for Memorial Day? Uh, I don't, I don't even know when that is. So I guess apparently not. <laughs> it's this weekend. I also oh, okay. did. I, I had somebody ask me if I had Memorial day plans and I just assumed that they meant independence day. And I, you know, like, so I, yeah, I'm going to probably go up to my mom's like everybody's vaccinated now. And they're like, you're going this weekend or whatever. And I was like, Oh, you're talking about a different holiday. So I think it's this weekend. Cool. In the States. So cook something <laughs> great. <laughs> um, I guess that answers that question for Ben. Um, when I got into it as a hobby, what was most daunting? Um, the most daunting part was uh, getting the tools to do the basic stuff. Because the problem with doing watch repair is that the basics of it are you get a watch, you take the movement out. That's the part that actually you know makes it tell time. And the way the watch repair works is you actually just take it completely apart. Every part of it comes apart. Then it's cleaned, then it's reassembled, and you put oil on it to make sure that it's running right. But you need a certain number of tools before you can actually reassemble it properly. And they're kind of expensive, and, they t and they're a little bit tricky to find. So that part was the most daunting for me because I'm like – I knew I was into the hobby. I liked, I was enjoying what I was doing, but it's like, bleh, you know, you have to spend kind of a bunch to get into it. And am I really going to want to keep doing this? Or is this going to be the kind of thing that I was like, that was cool, but I don't want to keep doing it. Thankfully I did want to keep doing it. So it, it worked out, but uh, yeah, that can be, that can be pretty tough. Um, Peter says, how much value is there in seeing the opponent's hand on a card like humiliate? 
if somehow it could be that the opponent discards their best card on their own instead of you seeing their hand, how much worse would it be? That's interesting. I don't know how to quantify it in terms of like 10% worse or, or what have you, but the knowledge of your opponent's hand can be quite valuable. It, it, it all varies. Like when you look at their hand and you see an expel or a combat trick, then yes, <laughs> it could be worth almost a whole card because you can really minimize how, how, how good their cards are. You see a negate in their hand. It's That's a card that's fairly easy to play around, right, and given the right situation. On the other hand, sometimes you look at their hand and it's just like two two more creatures and two lands after the card you took and – that value is basically zero. They're just going to cast their creatures and it doesn't matter. So mm-hmm. I would say like if you wanted to put it in terms of like what percentage of the card's power is in seeing their hand versus making them discard slash getting a plus one plus one counter when you're talking about humiliate, it's like probably like 10 to 20 percent of the value is in the, is in the, the looking at their hand. Sometimes it's going to be like maybe a little bit higher than that if their hand's particularly situational. Sometimes it's going to be lower if their hand is not situational at all. But you know, the, the discard is the biggest part, followed by the counters, followed by seeing what's in their hand. Do, do you think it scales with player skill? Like, do you think that you getting to look, let's say you turn to humiliate, um, you know, versus somebody who's newer to the, maybe not new to the game, but like an intermediate player or something. Do you feel like you can use that information a lot better than they can? I think that that's likely true because some people will see a card that is effective to play around but is a little difficult to play around and maybe not get full value from that. Mm-hmm. So it, it does depend on how you're going to use that information as well. In fact, I mean for some people in paper, like they'll just forget about what you have in your hand so it's got almost no value. Yeah, so, that's true. <laughs> Arena at least does show you so it's a little easier yeah. there. Yeah, because what I'll see is um, intermediate players will will use that information to play around the – most obvious things like a combat trick or something, but players like you will actually change their game plan around how they want to use their mana based on what the opponent has, not just combat tricks, but even like their creatures or things like that. Um, Jake says combat sports like the UFC have traditionally been organized around a matchmaking system where the league intentionally makes matchups that the fans want to see. Then they just have a champion at the top and everyone else is trying to earn a match against them by beating other highly ranked competitors. Do you think, or do you guys think that there's a place in Magic for a league structure this way, and what would that be like? And then Jake also says, "By the way, I know this is not the solution to the OP problems." I I don't think there's a, there's a whole lot of uh, value in this for Magic. I just don't think that. I think that combat sports and Magic are fairly different, like in terms of like. The perception of how it works, the personalities involved, like when, when you've got two two people who are going to like fight, you know, like a UFC fight, like it's a really big difference. They're very, so much of it is like individual, like this person's fighting style, you know, versus the other person's fighting style, their their history, all that stuff. And Magic has some amount of that, but you know, like I played Nassif in the finals of a pro tour, and so like, and then the top four of another pro tour, and like now if we played, we'd have that history, but. So much of what people care about when it comes to a Magic matchup is not really that specific to the people. Like some amount of people like to watch uh, top eight matches because they like the decks involved. And they're like trying to make it such a personality driven thing is going to be tough. And I think that's part of what they struggled with with the MPL was like, I think that there is room for a, you know, a a pro system in Magic that emphasizes or, or promotions that emphasize personalities more. But that wasn't the way to do it, and I don't know that this would necessarily be the way. Though I could see a sort of prize fight scenario. So maybe maybe that there is some value here if you can find the right matchups, but a lot of them are not going to be the right matchups. So it's kind of hard to tell, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I feel like that would be a cool way to do a one-off tournament, but not a cool way to do a competitive gaming league, right? Like part part of the excitement of sports and things like that is that it's it's – It's real, right? It's like, well, this person won, so then they get to do this thing, and there's nobody that can change that. Where if UFC, there's such a heavy promotional element to it where it's like they want to put certain fighters forward as kind of their next big face of the thing or whatever, and that feels a lot more contrived than it does if if it's just like they ended up fighting each other like it's special that you and Nassif played each other and when you do play each other because it wasn't that you were handpicked it's that you both earned your way to that spot you know kind of again and again um 
Brandon says, how many good draft decks are available in an eight person pod? Do you feel that no matter what seat you're in, there's a good deck to draft? These days, I kind of do feel that way. I mean, you know, they vary, but I, I feel like it's really like if, if, if you're a good drafter and you're reading signals and you're doing what you need to do, I do feel like I don't remember the last time that I had a deck, a non self inflicted deck <laughs> that wasn't, that was just <laughs> yeah. outright. What am I doing with my life? You know, they, they always end up with like playable creatures. It's more just like if I push too far and, some weird direction and don't end up being able to like cast my spells or whatever. I agree. I think that it, you know, so, sometimes you'll have better seats than others, but and you're not, you're not guaranteed a 10 out of 10. But I would say if you, if you're, if you know the format, if you do a good job drafting it, if you are open to, you know, drafting what, what's right for your seat and you don't get like tunnel visioned or you're not trying to force weird things, like you said, self-inflicted stuff, it feels like the floor is going to be like a seven or something. I, I, it's hard to get much worse than that, I feel like. And then the ceiling, of course, is, is much higher. Um, Hoyt says, piggybacking off of Peter's question, how much extra value do you give Test of Talents for being able to see their whole library? That That is less. I don't, I don't think that that's like super valuable because it is better to see it than not, but – it's not it's not even clear that like say playing around a wrath that you see in their deck is even good for you like it can be good for you obviously when you when they're at, when they're at one and you have three creatures out maybe you don't play your fourth creature but that's kind of what you should do anyway mm -hmm. and i know that there are people out there who have lost games because they've seen the opponent's library and they proceed to play around a card that's in their deck and then it just doesn't work because when i say like you know in a best of three game you should play around some of their stuff part of it is like and, and this is something that's hard to get good at, but it really does pay dividends is throughout playing the course of the game, you can get a sense of what card they might have in their hand because of the way they played and the actions they've taken. Every single, every single thing your opponent does can transmit some kind of information, right? From mm -hmm. which like, I mean, look at it this way in, in like a three color format, which there have been a lot of, if they lead on mountain mountain, you can basically rule out that they have plains or forests in their hand. If they're playing say like red, green, white, because those sets are always built such that the gold cards cost like red, green, white. So mm -hmm. if they lead on red, red, they just don't have other lands in their hand. And that's just from their playing their land drops. There's a lot of stuff you can you can get uh, and derive from how they play. But when you look at your opponent's library, you then know the cards you could play around, but they still just have like a, you know, they, they've three out of 27 chance of drawing something three turns later that they that, that, that you saw. So... It's not even that helpful. So, yeah, it's good to know because, like, it can definitely be like, oh, they've got two pigment storms. Okay, I'll, I'll you know, I'll expand an anatomy this to make it a 6-6 six, six, and they'll have trouble killing it. Definitely good value there. But it's not it's not as uh, not as useful because sometimes you can shoot yourself in the put, by, foot by playing around things that, you know, your opponent doesn't actually even have in their hand. Yeah, another one from Hoyt says, also related, would your opinion – of burying books go up or down if it put, if it put the card on the bottom of their library or shuffled it in as opposed to putting it second from the top it would go up you you're you're more often casting it on good creatures rather than bad creatures yeah cuz you do get a little benefit if you cast it on their bad creature cuz then you know that in two turns they're drawing it you can also sometimes leverage it in certain situations to try to stop them from drawing lands by saying okay well the next card better be a land cuz the next one after that's not going to be um, that, that these things are benefits to having it be second from the top. But like Louis said, you'd rather just, uh, just get rid of it. Um, if you had a magic wand says Weston, what, what one change would you make to magic? Uh, I would, I would give it, uh, a logical, sane, fun, and robust organized play system. <laughs> oh, very nice. I'll, I'll, I'll go with you on that. A few more questions and we'll call it a show here. RJ says, thanks for, being a quarantine sanity preserver. You bet, RJ. Uh, I've noticed after my worst draft train wrecks that I focus a bit too much on getting, quote, good cards at the end. And at the end, I have particularly weak set of two drops. What's your philosophy on the two drop slot as it's uh, important as my weak, likely results oriented internal pattern recognition software suggests? Two drops are really important for mm -hmm. both control and aggro decks. I mean, they're they're more important for aggro because like it's really hard to win when you don't start with a good two drop. But even for control decks, I mean, 
this format, Strixhaven, is not slow. Like, not everyone's playing aggro, but if you don't do anything on turns two or three, like, you're still going to lose a lot of those games. Like, you just can't do nothing. Your opponent might not be beating you down, but they're doing things. And trying to find two drops, and this is the reason they're so prized, is the good ones that are good early or late and are are just so valuable because they fill the need you want, which is when it's in your opening hand and you cast it on turn two, it's almost always good. Like, Imagine a two mana two two that had the ability like it started in your opening hand. Mm-hmm. That's the card I would basically always play one of. Mm-hmm. I, I would always play that card unless the format was like very strange because a two mana two two you can play on turn two is just going to get the job done of pressuring your opponent, blocking their two, you know, their their, their whatever their two two is, you know, getting a couple hits in, trading for a card like. When you play a two mana two two on turn seven, your opponent can mostly ignore it, and that's kind of why where they suck. But when you play it on turn two, even if it's got no other abilities, they're going to use their Lash of Malice on it because what is their other option? Take six damage. So two drops are, that that are good late are so important as a result because they're all good early, basically. And the ones that are good late are just a complete free roll way of getting to play these, you know, card that you want early and also getting value from it late. So I would say that you should, if you're if you're struggling with this, you should definitely prioritize two drops because they they are that valuable. Yeah, it's also important to remember that even on the decks that don't need to have a two mana creature necessarily, doing things on turn two is really important. Like you want to have two mana spells if you're not do like you rarely can play a game of magic where you don't do something on turn two. I've limited, I should say, uh, and and you know feel like you're really keeping up. But you need to be able to do stuff in two is an important juncture. Um, Ben says, in the vein of Gabby and LSV's cube release on MTGO, what's your favorite cube memory or play? Well, I have one that, that stands out always, um, from, I don't remember some older cube or whatever, but I had, um, Venser, the Sojourner, the, the plane, the, uh, the planeswalker. And it has an ultimate of minus eight. You get an emblem with whenever you cast a spell, exile target permanent, and I was able to to exa- to ultimate Venser. So that part's really great. But then the part that I really liked was the spell that was left in my hand was Mana War. And I had nine mana. And so I just cast it and returned it to my hand and then cast <laughs> it and returned it. To- so I got to win the game with Mana War in a very kind of <laughs> literal way. Um, and I, I, I felt like I peaked, you know, like that was kind of the most I really wanted to accomplish. And it's all been downhill since. Anything stand out for you? I mean, there's so many, right? I mean, Cube is just a factory for for creating these type of scenarios that are just unreal. Oh, there, there's so many all-timers I could choose from. One that does stand out is uh, when I had Course of Portal out. That's the one where you choose uh, Homage or Carnage, and your opponent then has to vote. And if they're tied, you just draw a card. But if you both vote Carnage, it blows up all non-land permanents. And I voted Carnage for just no reason. My opponent also chose Carnage. Uh and well, well, not no reason. I voted it knowing that they could just choose the other one. They chose Carnage as well. They had an Inkwell Leviathan in play, and I was going to die to it. But I also had a pretty good board. <laughs> they they apparently thought that their that their board was was worse. I thought their board was better. So the, the everything got blown up. I ended up winning the games a, a few turns later with like a Kiki Jiki or something. But I would have lost if they didn't vote there. And oh, it was man. funny because we both disagreed on the reality of the situation. I think I was right. They clearly thought they were right. And uh, it's a way to win off like a, a forced move, you know, yeah, that they, they got to choose. <laughs> I like that. I like putting it on, put it on the table, right? Like, Yeah, of course. Of course. All right. Uh, one more question. This one comes from Michelle who says, why are magic players generally the nicest, smartest, and most accepting people on the planet? I'm a middle-aged woman who started playing magic a few years ago with my sons. They stopped playing, but I can't quit. I love it so much. At my local gaming stores and even at GPs, I'm usually the only, quote, old lady, but the people I play against, mostly teenage boys and young men, treat me just like another player. They beat me or I beat them. It doesn't seem to matter uh, that I am as old as dirt. (laughs) My question isn't rhetorical. As a group, Magic players are pretty awesome, open-minded and accepting. Why is that? Any theories? And thanks for a great show, Michelle. Um, this is a great a great reminder, by the way, because mm-hmm. when I first thought that, I was like, are they, oh, are they being facetious? Mm-hmm. But uh, Michelle's talking about her experiences with actual human beings sitting across from her, and I completely believe everything she's saying, mm-hmm. especially after a year of not seeing anyone else. 
our experiences are probably tainted by the the, the general discussions you have online where people just yeah. act like complete tools, you know, mm-hmm. like, we, and one of the reasons I think that, you know, the, the good magic communities and good magic players of which there are many, uh, there are ones that aren't so good. I've, I've seen both in action, of course, is that I, I'd like to think that, uh, you know, a lot of magic players come here as a refuge from things that, that maybe aren't going great for them or just as a way to find other people who are passionate about something they're passionate about. And, and especially depending on your age, you know, there was a lot a time where a lot of this gaming stuff was and to some degree is depending on where you are was considered you know too nerdy and not cool and and something to, mm-hmm. to that that you have a hard time like finding acceptance for and if you can remember what that felt like when you start meeting other people who are newer to the game or even people who aren't new to the game and just kind of extending them that same courtesy and that same uh, like m- amount of inclusiveness and welcoming I mean, that, that could be one reason why, you know, Michelle has had these positive experiences. It's awesome and really heartening to hear that that's the, those are the experiences she's had. I know I magic really helped me go from like a very, very awkward, you know, teenager and young man to someone who's a lot more confident, a lot more able to talk with strangers and, to, you know, present myself in a way that I want to present myself, which I definitely did struggle with when I was younger. And I've had great experiences with the magic community. I know those aren't universal and I know there's a lot of reasons for why you might have good or bad experiences and it'll vary wildly, but I have overall had very positive experiences and I'm really glad to hear that Michelle has as well. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing, just that, you know, there does tend to be that kind of, uh, that feeling that, you know, if you find a place where you can belong, then you want to extend that out to other people. So hopefully that happens. Uh, as it has happened to Michelle, to, to as many other people as we can possibly get on board. I mean, the, we know we have the goods in this community with regards to the game itself, right? Like we, we, right. we know that like this game is, is legitimately one of the best things ever invented. <laughs> you know, it, it encompasses a very wide range of, um, experiences. And, um, so we have that on our side that the, the question is just, is the door open enough for the people that want to explore this space and figure it out. And yeah, I mean, you know, I think that you can find examples where it's not. And I think that you can find examples like Michelle here where it is. And and hopefully it keeps trending in a, in a, in the best direction we can make it trend. Okay. Let's call it a show there, Luis. Unfortunately, as usual, we were not able to get to all of the questions, but we did get a pretty good chunk uh, of them done. And we really appreciate everybody asking. Um, I did just go in order here. So if we didn't get to your question, it's not because we uh, thought that it was a bad question. We just didn't have time. But we will always be doing another Q&A episode down the line. So don't worry. Just keep it in your pocket and put it back up again. And we'll uh, we'll get to it one time or another. Um, before we go, got to mention our sponsor, ChannelFireball.com. Make sure you check them out for really anything that you need um, magic related. I mentioned CFB Pro uh, briefly at the top. But you know, as we start to look forward to more and more competitive events on arena, which we've seen pop up, we had the draft challenges over the last weekend before that the arena open and uh, those come in limited, but also in constructed formats, you know, there's money up for grabs now, right? It, it's not just, um, you know, pride points here. Like you can, you can really actually put some effort into it and, and have a chance to try to, to win some, some money. And if you want to be at the top of your game, CFB pro has it. You can go there and get in-depth breakdowns of uh, topics for different types of strategies, uh, limited, constructed, all of that kind of stuff. And you can really go in-depth and learn. And that's the type of thing that can really help you prepare for a bigger tournament specifically. Um, So, yeah, if you want to check that out, it's the the link is in the show notes for CFB Pro. As I mentioned before, if you do sign up, if you'd use the affiliate code LR, it does help us out and we appreciate it. Um, if you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. And you can find everything related to the show at LRcast.com, including all the episodes of the show right there uh, on the episodes tab. That's going to do it for this one. Thanks again for the questions and we'll see you next week. So, you know, we've got a dog, uh, Julie, and mm. she's uh, a pretty cowardly little dog. Like she, she, <laughs> She wasn't well socialized growing up with uh, other dogs. She She's very gr- good with people. She's actually fantastic with people. She loves meeting new people. She's like super patient with like small children. She's, she's really friendly. But she's kind of at a loss on how to interact with other dogs. She's like, uh, you know, just not very good at it. And 
uh, recently we had a we had a barbecue and one of our friends here, uh, Josh McLean, a former platinum pro <laughs> and uh, birthing pot enthusiast, he has this uh, really adorable puppy called Remy, who's uh, six months old and a little bigger than Julie, but not like that much bigger. And Julie just had a really hard time like interacting with him. Like she would, she would, she actually like peed on the floor because she does like the submissive peeing thing, and then she would like bark at him and like. She she was just really uncomfortable. They got better over the course of the thing, and we were very careful to like keep keep them apart so Julie wouldn't be too stressed out. Mm-hmm. And one thing that uh, that my brother suggested that worked out pretty nicely is having them meet and interact outside of the house because you know when you when a dog is inside their own territory inside their own house they get they feel a little more defensive when someone outside comes in and it's a higher pressure situation and. You know, and it, it, it's funny how well that worked, and it kind of made me think that people have that too, and it's really something good to keep in mind. That like, let's say you want to introduce uh, someone new to like your friend group, it, it's it's going to be a lot, I think, easier to do that and less high pressure or less tense to do that by say meeting to go to the movies or or at a meal, you know, at a, at a restaurant rather than like having them over at your house, for example, or mm-hmm. uh, you know. Finding the right situations to to integrate new social new, new people to a social circle, or or when you're gonna you know maybe if you're if you're gonna meet with someone and have like a high pressure conversation or something like that, people don't think enough about like aesthetics and environment and how all those things can impact other interactions which you might not consider related. Because mm-hmm. you know when I first look at it, two dogs meeting. Well, they're going to meet, they're going to interact, and they're going to figure out, you know, like they're going to get to know each other. It's such a big difference whether it's in one of the dog's houses versus not. Yeah. And that wasn't something I thought of immediately. And it's so true with people too. And it's just something to keep in mind based on whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, you know, how you'd like things to go, uh, your level of familiarity with everyone. Like obviously like if you're have if you're having like – you know, one of you know, let's say your brother's visiting, and you're going to have your brother meet your friends. Sure, have it at your house. Your your brother shouldn't really be impacted too much one way or the other. But like having a new friend over at your house, maybe they haven't even been to your house before to meet other new friends of you. That's just going to be a little different. You don't want them, you know, peeing on the floor or what have you. So, <laughs> <laughs> or the, the social version of that. So it's just interesting <laughs> looking at that and thinking about how, you know how you can change the stakes for different encounters and you can change the pressure level for different encounters. You know, one of the reasons why I think a lot of people really, you know, rightfully choose to have like a first date or first meeting of someone like they met online. Right. Especially if you're trying to like date someone is like at a coffee shop, pretty low pressure, right? A lot Mm -hmm. of other people around coffee shop is like by definition, casual, you peace out after 15 minutes. It's just not that big of a deal. You're not committed to a hour long dinner at a restaurant. You know, imagine you order and you're like, wow, this person's just a, <laughs> right. a real piece of work. I don't, I, I want to get out of here, you know? And like, you have to settle the bill or, or, or account for that somehow. Right. Maybe your food hasn't come yet. And you're just like, ah, oh, what do I do? So. Yeah. Well, just, and it, it shows your point by the way, to think, well, what if you went on your first date at one person or their's house? <laughs> like he yeah. wouldn't do that, right? Like that'd be crazy, right? It, it, like, it would be like way out of line, but it it really emphasizes like we don't even consider that an option, you know? Yeah, and, and I think it's just good to be mindful of like, look, I don't like analyze every single thing I'm doing from the lens of like who wins, who loses. That's not what I'm talking about. But when you look at a upcoming situation that has some amount of pressure to it, and like whether that's I want my dog to get along with my friend's dog so we can hang out together easily, or I want my friends to like this new person or I want to have, you know, a good, like I want to have a productive, but maybe uncomfortable, you know, serious conversation with someone, one of my friends we need to talk. There's ways you can frame it and set yourself up for success because you can look, what do I want to get out of this outcome or this interaction? And, And like I said, I'm not super, you know, I'm not so calculating about everything, but look, you know, when like, Let's say you you know you, you, if you if you're gonna if you're gonna meet up with with your your buddy Adam to play seal deck, there's zero pressure, zero stakes there. Mm-hmm. You guys have hung out hundreds of times. You guys mm-hmm. know each other really well. There's no there's no amount of nervousness, right? Right. But when you have when you're let's say having like let's say you decide to have a barbecue and you're like, wow, I'm gonna invite this 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 coworker who I've never really seen socially before, but I think could be cool. There's there are now some stakes to it, right? Like yeah. there, there's now a little bit of pressure, and you're like, oh, I care how they see me, and they see my living situation, and they care how my friends act. Like 
wouldn't be a great time for you know your your, your bozo cousin to get drunk and like pass out in the living room because right now now your coworker is like wow what kind of idiot you have you know but <laughs> yeah and when you have a situation and you can kind of tell when there's stakes like you know like in inside you you know that right like yep then I think that there's there's a lot of steps you can take to to ensure success so think about like. How long this interaction is going to be? Give people easy outs to leave if they want to leave in a comfortable fashion. You know, that's why like a barbecue where you have a bunch of food out and people kind of just like the cookout style come and go is very different than like, hey, I'd like to have my boss and his wife over for dinner. <laughs> where you, you know? sit down and have a specific <laughs> meal. Yeah, it's a big difference. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't really have like much of a point besides – it's interesting to think about how much framing and environment and all these things play into how interactions play out. And sometimes if you want an interaction or if you care about an interaction, you want it to go a specific way. Well, there's ways you can you can kind of improve your chances there. <laughs>